biggest adversaries who have the, the capability of utilizing a lot of resources um, to attack you, how would you protect it? Next. Um, uh, some of the work I'm going to talk about was done by Xiao Kui. Um, uh, some other work was done by another former PhD student, uh, Kui. We have collabor collaborators from both Virginia Tech uh, and the Penn State, um, and Trent also comes to the conference. Um, Again, the, the slides will be made available and also the, the videos. Um, uh, we're going to talk about some of our work just to give you some idea of what uh, this, uh, um, uh, our, you know, what the, the typical approach are with the typical workflow. But we're going to also talk about a high level um, um, sort of recipe like um, uh, work that hopefully when you go back, you have some idea of how to make this applicable to solve your problem. Um, so, so outline, and, and the, the goal is, again, encourage uh, similar uh, lines of research, anomaly detection. And we have done this a lot, and we really believe it, it's uh, a lot of fun doing this, and, and also very general approach. And of course, in a specific context, you have to figure out exactly what are the features, what are the data, what they're looking for. Um, and, uh, so we're going to have a hands-on activity toward the end. Uh, just a little bit of context um, in, in the sense that you know, it's not that everyone needs anomaly detection. And, and the truth of the matter is that you probably haven't really used it to, um, or, or done, done work on this. And so why bother, right? Um, Antivirus scanning, this is uh, the technology that people have seen a lot. And um, it's absolutely the first line of defense. And even if you have anomaly detection, still make sure you install scanners and then do scan regularly on your computer, on the computer you manage, your organization. Uh, this is a, a, a picture that I downloaded from Virus Total website. This shows, I think, early, late last year, uh, in a week, how many files submitted to VirusTotal website. VirusTotal uh, um, can do scanning for f all kinds of file types. The x axis shows the file type types. The y axis shows the number of submissions per week. And so it's, it's a very popular services. Uh, you can do it online or offline. They also have desktop versions. Um, first line of defense, however, because because um, back in the 80s, Fred Cohen proved, and, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this uh, um, theorem, um, it's it undecidable to, um, to determine whether a piece of program is a virus or um, uh, a benign. And, and, and the, the, the proof is very simple, very similar to the halting problem, proof of the halting problem. And it's undecidable, undecidable whether a program halts or not. And, and so if you have a scanner program that can um, make this decision, and then the virus would change its behavior to counter the decision. So every time you reach a uh, contradiction. Um, and so, so this is uh, very intuitive and also somewhat counterintuitive. But in reality, you see this theorem play out in slow motion in the real world. And, and a lot of the malware writers, before they release their malware, they would do an antivirus scan. You know, they would try trend Michael Symantec and so on. If they trigger an alert, they will go back home and then change their uh, code a little bit, uh, tweaks a little bit, uh, just to bypass the signatures and, and then release, re release the new malware without triggering any alert. And so, so with this uh, in mind, uh, how would you do anything? Um, and this only means that we just have to work harder. You, you, you not only have the scanner techniques, and you also need to have a more advanced um, um, methods that complement uh, complements the, the conventional detection so that you have multiple line of defenses. If one fails, if, new, if it's new malware, if, uh, this, where signature haven't been uh, included in the database, then hopefully you can catch to using other uh, detection mechanism. Uh, or you have um, things like moving target defense where 
where people uh, can I can I go back to the previous slide? Uh, previ previous slide. I have a problem with this control. The last slide. Oh, sorry, but this oh, this okay. All right, this works. Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> um, Moving target defense. Um, so, so just a, a, a couple of um, um, names where it uh, shows the, the more advanced uh, um, methodologies. Uh, moving target defense basically say, you know, don't run the same um, uh, software for everybody. Uh, you have uh, um, uh, software diversity. You can have network diversity. Don't, don't use the same static IP address. You know, IP address keep changing. Of course, you have to make sure that your IP address um, has to be be um, known by the party there you're communicating, so you cannot just have a random IP address. No one would not uh, be able to find you. Um, control flow integrity is something we're going to talk about. Uh, also, it's another complementary sort of orthog orthogonal technology to anomaly detection. Um, Anomaly detection, um, so I, I show pictures. This is uh, Dorothy Denning. This is Stephanie uh, Forrest. The, the, the basic concept is that um, Instead of having a, a binary classification where you say, okay, this is bad, this is uh, good, uh, and, and you know what the bad look like, what good look like, um, it, here you don't know what are the bad behavior, what are the anomaly behaviors. Um, however, you do know what are the normal behaviors to a certain extent, what's your expectation. Um, so therefore, you, you define a boundary um, specifying what is a normal behavior, and then the outliers uh, are very likely to be suspicious event caused by attacks, um, uh, errors, uh, misconfiguration and so on and so forth. And, and so the concept is extremely broad in the, the, the uh, extremely uh, promising. Um, Uh, so before we start to talk about the uh, overflow of program anomaly detection, um, I want to avoid the confusion that a lot of um, us could have. So um, we want to keep it very um, precise to talk what we are going to detect today. So program anomaly detection can be different from um, malware classification. For malware classification, one try to classify whether a piece of software is virus or not. For program anomaly detection, what we are working on is more likely giving you Firefox, giving you SendMail. We try to make sure whether it's executing, it's running normally, or it's being hacked, exploited. So um, usually we have some sense about uh, how programs should run normally, and then we try to learn from these normal runs, no matter it's a model learned from dynamic analysis or static analysis of the program, then we build a model and then we try to execute the program in the deployed environment to test whether it's uh, behave like what we see in the normal behavior cases that we train. So the uh, typical workflow for program anomaly detection we have here is we get an executable. Here is a car, very um, decent car, and then we uh, drive the car, we run the program in some constrained environments that we know that this is a testing environment. We drove it in a, in a very beautiful paved road, in you know, some highways that we test the car, so make sure that all the functionality works and we know how the car should behave. And then for each of the run we have that we drove the car, we just uh, provide the, the, mm, the mechanics in the car and try to get some traces of how it works inside the car. We get it into profiles um, from the traces, and then we build a normal model of the car, what the, how the car should run out of these normal profiles. And then we get an understanding how the car should run. Another way that we can understand how the car should run normally is not by running the car, but by disassembling the car so to understand how the drive chain works, how the power is sent to the, from the engine to the views. That's static program analysis we do for the binaries. We can also build this type of normal model to inspect 
whether a function in a program can call another function, whether a routine in a program can call another routine, whether a system call can follow another system call by inspecting inside the program. This is another approach that people usually do to build a model that uh, how we understand the program should behave. And then after we build the model, we can deploy, we can release the program and deploy it in some environment, and we execute the program. Like we may ex uh, we may drive the car eventually by deliver it to the customer, and the customer drive it on some highways, on some maybe off-road conditions, and then we generate a lot of traces. And uh, we compare whether these traces we generate the behavior of the uh, deploy environment matches what we get from the model, what the car should behave. If it is a match, then that's fine. It's behaving normally. The Firefox is running correctly. If not, then that could be hacked, exploited. OK. In today's talk, we will focus in mainly on data-driven approaches. That means we are not focusing on um, disassemble the, the, the binary and get uh, static analysis results. We are most focusing on the first path to build a model and the third path to test the model. So uh, in data-driven approach, which is one branch of program anomaly approach, we will, uh, we will talk about other branches uh, summarized then. So we get a training phase. That means we generate the data, we try to build a model from the data we generate, and then we have a detection phase, which means we run the program in the real-world production mode, and then we try to detect whether the program matches the, the normal model we have. So this is the typical workflow we have for program anomaly detection from a data-driven pers uh, perspective. OK, so uh, here we give a, a simple example of um, program anomaly detection. This is the most prim primitive program anomaly detection model that people use, invented by Forrest in 1996. And uh, it's called ngram, so that very simple idea, just to give you a very long program trace, chop it into small pieces, like um, um, four system calls together, four system calls together. And then you build a model to testify whether the execution of the program in the test uh, in, in the detection mode matches all the engrams you generate in the training mode. So, uh, for example, we have some of the data. Uh, we we generate a sequence of per, uh, system calls from the program in the testing mode, in the training mode. So that's um, I/O control, open, write, read, and um, then we use a sliding window to slide um, through these system calls and to generate. Um, two or three system calls together. Those, those are the um, uh, two grams or three grams that we generate. And uh, then in the detection mode, we also generate these two or three grams from the trace we are trying to detect. And then to try to find whether one of these n gram exists in our uh, model that is uh, in, in our training database. So if it exists, then that's OK. That's normal. If it does not exist, that's something we need to um, report an alarm. We need to go inspect it. And that's a basic idea of NGRAM, very, very primitive program anomaly detection tool. And we will um, uh, have the hands-on activity to test, uh, build, to build, try to build an NGRAM model by all of you. And I have write a very simple script to build this model. And you will try that at the end of this tutorial. And um, so that that's, uh, uh, give you some basic sense of how NGRAM, the most primitive um, program anomaly detection, uh, how to build a model and how to <coughs> test. So um, besides, beyond engrams, there are also many other approaches that invented um, during the years from 1996, 20 years ago to now. We have engram model, we have finance data automata models invented by Shaker and uh, um, Wagner. So Shaker gets a um, kind of a data-driven perspective of a finance data automata, and Wagner gets a static analysis perspective uh, finance data automata invented. And then people found the static, uh, finance data automata is not accurate enough because um, we have a, a kind of a call stack in a program when it runs. So people get a call stack plus a, stat, uh, a finance data automata, and we get a push down automata model in uh, 2003 and 2004. We also have machine learning models, um, firstly introduced by Dr. Lee or Professor Lee in Gatech. And um, we also have hybrid detection models that combine 
um, the data-driven path and the static analysis path to get the, uh, the training accelerated so that you, you can get a very fast training out of it. We also have some data flow analysis embedded into the push-down automata and other static analysis uh, approaches so that to get it more accurate when you go down the static analysis path. And um, if we put all the different models um, from the perspective that I told you from the, the car model, you can do data-driven model, you can do static analysis model, then we get something like uh, three categories. Um, some of the methods fall into the category of pure data-driven or mostly data-driven approaches. For example, the NGRAM model, uh, you only need to run the program. You do not need to know the binary of the program. You run the program and get the, uh, the, the system calls. You chop it into n-grams, and you build a model. And then in 1997, um, we get the first the finance the automata built out of the dynamic trace. And uh, 1998, we have the machine learning model proposed by um, Professor Lee. And we also have 2001 and 2003, we have finance the automata and push down automata models built from dynamic traces. So we do not care about uh, the binary, how the binary is written. 2004, uh, we have a paper, uh, not we, but the field, we, we get a paper to summarize all the uh, approaches to get um, system calls or some extra information um, uh, underneath system calls about uh, um, function, uh, uh, the, the um, the program counters and other information. So um, Gao in the paper called it a gray box model. So to get more details than traditional black smart models about uh, dynamic traces. And uh, this is a kind of a summary paper. And uh, last year, um, we have a CCS paper to give a kind of advance in the dynamic driven approach so that we propose uh, an approach to analyze very long program traces using data mining approaches to mine various DLC, uh, to prevent various DLC program attacks. And uh, so the first category I just mentioned here is mostly or purely or mostly data-driven approach. You do not need to know much about the program, the binary, how it works. And the second category represents that uh, mostly or or, or uh, the approach that is done by static analysis. So you get a program, you um, analyze the, the binary of the program, the source code of the program, and you understand what is allowed in the binary. And, that, and the assumption underneath it is all the allowed trans um, transfers in the binary or the, uh, or the source code of the program is normal behaviors. And that's a way that one way people define what is normal in static analysis. And so we have finance automata and push down automata and push down automata with data analysis in this category. And uh, the third approach combines some of the uh, thing in the, uh, in the first two approaches. And that is a hybrid one. That the, uh, the advantage of the hybrid approach is to accelerate the chaining of the first approach by adop adopting some of the static analysis. So the first paper here is proposed by Liu in 2005, and uh, our group also have some papers uh, last year and this year falls into this category of hybrid detection. Um, OK. And uh, some uh, notable milestones in the timelines. And we can see that uh, the first paper is a concept paper proposed by um, Danning about uh, ex expert in train detection system. And Forrest to get this idea and put it into program analysis field. So we get a further program analysis paper about program anomaly detection in uh, 1996. And then throughout the years, we have some of the papers I just mentioned. We have um, a summary paper. For example, in 2008, Forrest has a paper to summarize all the system call norm detection papers. And in uh, 2015, last year, I ha we have a paper in read last year to give a uniform framework to understand any program anomaly detection model. So the basic idea is to map any program anomaly detection paper into a formal language so that you can understand the detection capability of, you can compare the detection capability of any program anomaly detection using this formal language model. You can have a regular language, context sensitive language, context free language, you can, you can try to compare them. And uh, um, some of the Two attacks that we want to attack and defend, we want to mention here. 2005, we get um, uh, control flow integrity. So that is not program anomaly detection. Um, but 
it's actually some give you some taste of uh, program norm detection from the static analysis perspective. If you think of static analysis and you combine it into the prevention mode, then you can harden the program by itself that uh, which is allowed, which is not allowed in the program. Then we can think in this way, we can go uh, from program norm detection to control flow integrity. And in 2016, um, um, I think Oakland, there was a paper on um, um, data-oriented programming, which is a very great paper, which is the advance of the version of 2005 non-control data attack. And uh, that is uh, a type of attack partially um, addressed by our last year CCS paper, the, the, uh, the CSL model. Okay. Um, I want to add a, a few um, uh, comments on C, uh, CFI, and, uh, and I know since uh, 2005, CF, CFI has been um, uh, really popular last year in CCS. He, uh, it won uh, the 10-year Test of Time Award, um, tons and tons of followers, uh, and recently Intel also had this uh, CET. Uh, technology it is sort of commercialized the CFI. Um, so uh, anomaly detection, the, the technique that we uh, described today is going to be uh, complementary to CFI. And, and so in the sense that a lot of the techniques that CFI cannot give, it's a control flow. Um, if it's data flow attacks, uh, attacks that violate data flows, and especially in the, in the DOP, the data-oriented programming, um, it will not be able to detect the CFI has um, uh, no um, 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 it is, is, is not very useful. Um, and also CFI has no quantity of information. The, the beauty of anomaly detection using machine learning data mining had this um, frequency analysis, a probabilistic analysis. And um, so you know certain transition could occur. And in addition, you know how likely it's going to occur with what frequency. Um, Um, so, so where where do I start? Uh, where, where do you start? Um, a, a lot of the technique involve a tracing. Um, in, in, so you have to monitor the program behavior, um, and then the behavior we, we broadly define. You trace system costs, library costs, and function costs. Um, those are some tools. Uh, PIN al allow you to do function level tracing. Um, S trace extremely slow. I would I would say in the production environment, no one in their right mind would use S trace. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, 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 some figure uh, later on. It, it usually ten times slow down. Uh, PN is double double uh, you know 200 percent overhead. Intel PT is the savior um, in the sense that this is a hardware uh, from Intel was recently unveiled and later last year we are extremely excited about it because it, 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 it traces instructions on CPU. It's sort of uh, hardware assistant instruction level tracing um, extremely fast. So 5% is actually 4.7%. Even if after reconstruction to control flow graph, after the, the reconstruction, uh, it, it's under 9%. Uh, overhead extremely fast. Uh, of course, if you want to reconstruct it back to function level, in, in the sense, you know, instruction level tracing extremely low level, right? Um, in, it's a huge mess. And when you when you look at the PT trace, you, you couldn't believe how messy it is. You have no idea what it's about. Um, if you want to reconstruct it back to some semantic level, you know, function call, library call in a human understandable language uh, a level of call behaviors, um, it, it takes time, uh, but it's doable. Um, and they will not, you know, you can do the reconstruction to function level offline, so your, your production system will not be slowed down. Um, I listed the GDB there because it's a very good tool for beginners. Um, and uh, in the program analysis, this is where if you want to perform, say, static program analysis to understand uh, the code. A, a lot of times in, the, uh, in our assumption is that uh, the, the code is available, um, in, say, if, if 
you know, Navy want to monitor the program running on, on ba Navy battleship, and they would assume that they know they have the, the, the code. And even if you don't have the code, you probably have the, the binary, and then you could, uh, we assume that you reverse engineer it. So, so in, in the, a static or, or dynamic analysis give you additional information. Um, some of the tools we use, the Dynast, uh, in one of the, our analysis. Um, machine learning and data mining, we, we just use off the shelf uh, libraries. Uh, Weka, we use it a lot. Um, and there's also uh, sort of ad hoc libraries that you can use. But, but I, listed, I listed it here. Um, uh, some, some, some components where, where you, uh, that are relevant. Um, dimension reduction, this is where you, you always want to have a, um, a certain mechanism to, um, to identify the most important features. Uh, binary classification where you say, okay, I have um, some training data that has labels uh, good and bad, and I want to train the classifier um, to, tell, to learn new samples. Outlier detection is where you don't have labeled training data for malicious uh, behaviors. You only have the normal traces. This is where you do you know, one class SVN and so on. Data set, we don't have a lot of uh, uh, good data set. We're in the process of publishing some of our data set. Um, so this, this is one of the unfortunate aspect of uh, uh, anomaly detection, but, but we're working on it and to make it more available so that different techniques then can be comparable. Um, very quickly, who uses this? Uh, the answer is, uh, as far as I know, nobody, <laughs> because people have a lot of alerts already. Um, this is a recent study, I think a couple years ago. This is just a typical alert without even this advanced anomaly detection system. Um, security analysts are overwhelmed. Anomaly detection, the, one of the, the biggest problem uh, um, is, is uh, the, the large amount of uh, alerts. In the sense, it's so hard to define normal behaviors. Uh, a typical program, especially complex one like web servers, has very complex uh, normal behaviors. Um, so you know, one of our, our recent focus is how to reduce uh, the alerts in, in a way that does not compromise detection. Uh, but this is something that you always keep in mind. Um, uh, OK, very quickly, following the example, the n-gram, the n-gram example, Xiao Kui showed the two gram. What's the problem is? Why, why is that not sufficient? One of the issues is that for those kind of solution build totally based on dynamic traces, um, you are at the disposal of the completeness of your trace. If your trace is incomplete, your model is incomplete. If your model is incomplete, it will uh, it will raise more false alarms because at the runtime, there's a new trace coming out. Uh, it's, it's normal benign trace, and it's not in your model. You say, oh, I, I've never seen this. Um, so, so this is a table from SIR. This is a um, very well-known uh, database uh, of, of test, test suites um, uh, from, uh, maintained by uh, Nebraska Lincoln that shows even with this um, sort of a high caliber test suite, you, know, you, you see the coverage is not that good. Um, another issue with uh, the simple ngram uh, solution that uh, we showed you is that it uh, performs completely local analysis in you know, two gram. You know, how big can it be? You can do 20 gram or 100 gram. 100 gram is still local analysis in the sense that a trace can be infinite long. You know, if you think about the send mail, web servers, a trace is just uh, goes on and on. Um, uh, it, it, and the local analysis, the problem is that when you see locally, it, the, you could see all benign things happening, you know, baseball and so on. But then at the global level, when you put things all together, it looks like a really crazy medium. Um, so, so, you know, we really need to have a, a better ways of, um, um, you, know, you, do you do both the local analysis and global analysis, have a more holistic picture. And there's no, no way not to do it, uh, considering the data analytic techniques uh, uh, research has been developed um, tremendously in the recent years. So here is an example of um, 
So this example of uh, anomaly that cannot be detected locally. So uh, this is the SSH daemon, the authentication procedure, or the routine of the SSH daemon, very old version, and it has a vulnerability. Um, the vulnerability happens, uh, so first I will give you some um, sense about how it runs normally. The first uh, normal run is that if you have a correct password, then the, the blue block will run, and authenticated variable will be set one, and then the while loop will go, uh, the, the program will go all over the while loop, and then the green block will run. Another case for the normal behavior is that you have a wrong password, then only the red block will run. So what the attacker comes from, uh, comes into is it, uh, the attacker can explore it, um, the stack, and then to overwrite the variable authenticated. So that means the attacker, even he does not have the correct password, the blue block will never run because the password is not correct. The attacker will run the, the red block, which means the, uh, the password is wrong. However, because authenticated, the variable is set to one, overwritten to one by the stack overflow, the attacker will go to red and uh, green block, which is very strange because the, it, it, you, it does not happen in any of the normal cases without the, the blue one. So any of the local analysis cannot find it because if you break the, the traces into um, system calls, function calls, even instruction level things, any of the two instructions goes one to another perfectly and everything is normal. However, if you go from a global perspective, you will find that the red one shouldn't happen with the green one without the, the blue one. So that's a the, the something that we want to show about the, um, what we call it as a montage anomaly uh, is a kind of a montage of pieces and things, or concurrency anomaly. Okay. Um, so. Okay. So uh, some of the tech model we will talk today later, and the first one is concurrency anomaly or montage anomaly. I just give you one example, SLD example, that uh, uh, some pieces of the tech is normal, but when they assemble together, they are anomalous. And then we also have frequency anomaly, which characterize the uh, anomalous frequency ratios between the pieces that assemble together. So this could be a ratio between two pieces. There could be a kind of a relation between ratios of multiple pieces. And uh, um, what we are starting then is to study the anomalies that buried in a very long, extremely long program trace. For example, for Sandmail, it winds runs throughout the day, throughout the months. And for example, for Firefox, if you um, run it for a long time, and SSD, this type of mostly server demons, and uh, then you get very long program traces, you want to understand um, what the program should behave in this type of long traces. Okay, um, ngram does not work here. That is because when you increase the number, uh, the the the, the uh, letter n, you increase it from twenty to one hundred to one thousand. Then you are running into a detection space. That is two, uh, not two. Um, the number of um, items could be a system cost or function cost to the num to the power of n. So that is the size of the detection space you are running into. You need tremendous number of training traces to fill the, the, the space. That is impossible, actually. So you need some new tools to um, uh, uh, specify uh, something in the, in the detection space and try to build the detection model for it. So ngram does not work. Finance automata does not work, which also are local analysis, and push down automata also local analysis. And um, um, so um, we, we will talk about uh, two um, a state of art or the new technologies that I invented last year at uh, um, mostly in our group. And uh, one is about uh, to do program anomaly uh, detection on a large scale program trace. The second one is to um, include some of the static analysis results to accelerate the training of the dynamic approach. For example, hidden Markov model of the, of the um, detection. And uh, after we talk about these some new uh, advances in the, in the literature, we will go back to the um, maybe primitive models and let you try some of the primitive models about ngrams and the finance automata, and I will visualize some of the results. OK. So to handle the very large program trace, um, one of the basic or fundamental thing we've done is to profile the trace not in a sequence, but in a, a kind of a core transition matrix so that we can get 
the very large detection space into a smaller one, into some finite size space. So um, when we get a very long program trace, we chop it into a very long program behavior instance, for example, based on um, one of the authentication session of SRD, and then we profile each of the uh, long trace behavior instance trace into this type of dynamic generated core graph, or core, uh, core graph, which is represented by the transition frequency matrix, the blue one on the left. We also have a simplified binary version of this matrix, which is called event concurrence matrix. And we use the two matrix to represent some of the behavior of the program in a very long trace and try to build the normal behavior out of it. And uh, one of the challenges we meet, um, all of you will meet, if you try to analyze a very large program trace, a very long program trace, is that when the, the length of the program trace increases, then you get very diverse program behaviors. Example here is that libpcre is a very um, fundamental library used in Linux, and uh, this is a per um, regular expression library used by a lot of utilities, such as Grab, and um, very, very simple one. When it's given, it is given different parameters, different arguments, we still get seven very distinct behaviors out of it. So the seven distinct behaviors are represented by the function calls inside the libpcre. So different function calls called, different frequency are made, so we get different uh, distinct behaviors, even this simple um, program. So you can imagine that if you are running into maybe a large programs such as Microsoft Word, SSD, or Firefox, then you get very complicated program behaviors. And some of the anomalies could um, reside into this type of uh, uh, normal program behavior space. So that uh, earlier we mentioned the SLD attack, which is an assembly of normal pieces. Then if we show it in a detection space, it could be something like this. The anomaly resides into a space that is surrounded by different normal behavior, but it's actually in a space that is, shouldn't be covered in the normal uh, the scope of normal behavior. So if we only apply um, off the shell, out of the shell uh, uh, data mining techniques to build maybe some classifiers around all the normal behaviors of the program, then we will get a lot of false negatives. So here, um, when we try to detect this anomaly, the, the yellow point, using uh, one class SVM um, out of shell one, we will miss we are not detected because the, the, the uh, classifier will learn that this space is actually a normal one, but it's actually not. So um, what we get is, what we invented is a type of a detection mechanism that uh, has a two uh, detection layers and two learning layer and two detection layers. So first, we try to learn different functionalities of the program using cluster, um, clustering algorithms. And we have some specific clustering algorithms that is invented for program behaviors. And when we cluster different um, program, long program traces into different uh, clusters, each cluster could represent a functionality or a bunch of similar functionalities. And then inside each of the cluster, we do classification using um, traditional uh, classification tools from data mining. And then we get a more precise idea of what this normal behavior should reside into the subspaces of the entire detection space, which is pretty, actually pretty large. So in the detection phase, we will do two layer detection. The first is we try to detect whether the new coming behavior falls into one of the um, cluster we already have, which is one of the functionality. If not, then it should be, it could be something like a montage of different normal pieces, but this is anomalous. If it's goes in one of the cluster we already have, we also detect, or we try to test whether it's within one of the classifiers boundary we already have, which is normal boundary. If not, then that's something we call frequency anomaly. That means some um, very subtle changes about the ratio or relation between the frequencies of the things, but still uh, outside the boundary of normal we have. So example of the detecting SHD um, uh, attack I just presented to you. So in one of the normal wrong, um, we can have correct password, which we will get some, this is a function call trace about uh, SHD. Uh, so when the password is correct, we get some of the f function calls listed on the left. When the password is 
run, we get some of the function call listed on the right. So if we get an attack that do not have the correct password, but uh, because the attacker could overwrite the, the variable authenticated and get authenticated in, so the attacker will run the run passwords um, uh, trace of the program, and then suddenly go into the um, uh, correct password trace. Actually, there is a kind of uh, um, overlap the trace between all of the three, so no local analysis could work here if the local analysis window is not large enough. So when we apply our detection approach about the compact matrix representation, about the, the classifier things, we are applying the, the detection on the entire authentication procedure so that we, our algorithm understands the, the relationship between all the uh, function calls within this entire trace. That's the reason why we can detect uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the red block shouldn't occur with the, uh, the blue block together. OK. Um, by using the two-layer training and detection um, procedure, we get rid of the low false negative <laughs> issue. So that means we can precisely, more precisely, um, uh, describe the normal behaviors and uh, uh, do not get into the uh, montage anomaly or crest anomaly not detected. And uh, on the left is a figure with a very low detection rate about the um, traditional out of the sh off the shelf uh, classifi uh, classifiers, and the one on the right is our two layer clustering plus classification technique. Okay. So um, I mentioned the two-layer clustering plus classification multiple times. Um, what actually happens here is we have the inter-clustering training, um, which means we build clusters. And we have the intra-clustering training, which means we build classifiers inside each of the clusters. And we do training and detection on both of the layers. And that's the reason why we, we have some better detection results. OK, uh, some of the results for the um, to understand how accurate or how sensitive the system is, um, we um, uh, generate some of the um, different type of anomalies. For example, montage anomaly, which is the concatenation of normal pieces of the program behavior into an anomalous one. We have uh, incomplete path anomaly or frequency anomalies, which means high frequency anomaly is something similar to denial of service attack, and low frequency anomaly is something um, similar to some attack that the that, uh, attacker try to go into the system um, without authentication or without some proper procedures. So those are the things that we detect better. The, the both lines, both dotted line and solid lines are our algorithms, detect uh, better than the uh, traditional uh, uh, classification algorithms. OK. And uh, some of the results detecting real-world attack reproduced attacks. And uh, um, um, we have pretty good detection rates and uh, uh, with very low um, false positive rate. The false positive rate is computed by the cross-validation um, we have. And um, OK. So uh, to summarize the, the short periods that I just uh, talked about is that we try to address the issue of uh, some anomalies that is constructed using um, fragments of normal program behavior, but the entire uh, behavior is anomalous. That's something we need to have a global perspective of the trace so that we can understand what happened, what could co occur together in a trace and what, what could not. And uh, we try to detect the co-occurrence anomalies and frequency anomalies. And um, we are handling very long program traces. And we try to get low false positives. So the um, trade-off of our approach is that we profile because we are handling very, la very long program trace. And we cannot profile trace using sequences, traditional sequences, which, which will run into very large detection space. So we use um, compact matrices to profile the thing. Using the matrices, we lose the order of the events. Function calls or system calls, that means our approach is not path sensitive. And that gives the attacker some kind of a, um, a sense that the attacker could invent some mimicker attacks that bypass our detection tools and our tool could be combined together with traditional order um, sensitive or, or kind of uh, flow sensitive analysis to better serve the detection purpose. Okay. 
And one thing I want to, um, if you want to reproduce, uh, if, if, so one of the challenges so for uh, Data-driven anomaly detection is evaluation. Every time we start the evaluation, we think about you know where can we get the data set. And, and a lot of time, that uh, there are two ways to to uh, obtain data set. Three ways. You know, for normal traces, you just run the program with uh, um, certain inputs, and sometimes um, it, because you want to, you do want to have a wider coverage, and you have to. Um, have graduate students or some students to sit there and then you know poke around the, the program, making sure that the, the normal traces are somewhat uh, uh, um, uh, comprehensive. It doesn't have to be 100%, and probably would be impossible to be 100%. Uh, but the most important is anomaly traces. Where do anomaly traces come from? And uh, uh, we reproduce attacks um, and, and then collect the traces. Um, so, so you have to be somewhat uh, good at system um, reproducing exploits and there are tools, uh, meta exploit, and and uh, uh, and, and so on. Um, and and the the sort of category which we use a lot is uh, th synthetic traces, synthetic anomaly traces, where you um, say permutate a certain cause to create this synthetic artificial anomalies and then see whether your program can detect it. Um, and, and you would think that's easy. It turns out that's hard um, in the sense that uh, you know, one of the, uh, a lot of our permutation we did are really subtle. And, and also the synthetic traces allow you to say, um, to, to measure to what degree your anomaly would break your detection. And so, so you, don't, you don't just say, OK, we detect this, we detect that. And you, you sort of have this more scientific approach in saying to what degree we can detect, what degree we cannot detect. And, and we want to make sure always that if you have baseline comparison, and, and you know, it's always a good idea to have baseline comparison where you say, uh, this approach detected, that approach cannot detect it, and, and then and you, you apply in a more, um, it, it's a fair comparison, right? So, so synthetic traces or real-world anomaly traces, it's, it's all being compared uh, fairly in, in a fair um, environment. So I just want to, because of the, we do have hands-on activities, uh, I just want to quickly go over some other work we did uh, that involve more program analysis. Um, and we actually integrate program analysis with a hidden Markov model. Um, so hidden Markov model is what uh, Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Forrest demonstrated back in the 90s. And um, it was also used in uh, uh, invariant uh, work uh, in 2006. Uh, um, uh, so, so it was widely used. Um, it was also used in you know, weather forecast, speech recognition. Um, and, and people use it in a way that I don't like. In, in, in what aspect? The initialization of hidden Markov model is always random. Um, you, the, the number of hidden states are ar somewhat arbitrarily chosen. The transition probabilities, this is where you, you have um, the hidden states you don't see, but you do see the observable state. You know, it could be cloudy, rainy, sunny, right? Um, it's all controlled by the hidden states. If you're in a certain hidden states, then the, the likelihood of having a cloudy day is of you know 90 percent. Um, if you are in a different hidden state, the likelihood of having a sunny day is 100 um, percent. And uh, and if you have a rainy day today, the likelihood of you have a sunny day tomorrow is a certain percentage. And in the program, we think the program has certain internal structure that control what cause it makes. And that makes a lot of sense. This is why people use a hidden Markov model to summarize the normal behaviors. But then those probabilities, the emission probabilities, and the transition probability from, uh, between hidden states are somewhat all randomly um, started, uni either uniform distribution or um, uh, some random distribution. And, and we, we ask the question, well, why you, know, you have the code in your hand, and you know there are certain sequences that are going to happen uh, in certain order. Why don't you make use of that information and make hidden Markov model smarter? And can you do it? Um, so, so, so we started uh, uh, um, from a, a program uh, 
analysis. We look at the code, and, and, and there are plenty of tools. In this case, we use a dynast, uh, which give you this control flow graph. Um, and, and we say, OK, can we basically interface control flow graph with hidden Markov model in a way that uh, instead of having random initialized uh, parameters, we have parameters that makes more sense. Um, so, so the basic idea is that we say, OK, each, hidden, each control flow uh, graph node is a hidden state. In, in this case, we give hidden states some more specific concrete meanings. Um, and then uh, each uh, observable event is a system call. And, and so if, if you do that, you have this uh, 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 matrix representation. Um, and, and so graph and the matrix are somewhat interchangeable. And in the, in, in the probabilities that we have, we, we do this static estimation of probabilities. So we say, OK, if we're given a graph, if we see a branch, we say, OK, maybe it's half-half. You know, you have half chance to go left, a half chance to go right. And so, so we did a lot of the estimation ahead of time before we use a hidden Markov model. And then we have all uh, this. Um, you, you, have, you have to be, you know, you, because you have to follow probabilistic laws, it gets a little bit complicated. But eventually, you have this gigantic call transition table, which you can use to directly initialize a hidden Markov model. Um, and, and then, because we have this specific meaning of hidden states, and this is uh, we, uh, how we do it. And so, I just want to um, show you some of the results. Uh, oh, this is. Oh, so one of our work we also um, have this context sensitivity in it where you, when you observe a system call, you know which function makes this system call. When you have a, a library call, you know the calling site. And, and, so, um, it, and so if you go to uh, see the, the Eiffel Tower, you want to see it in Paris and not to see the one in, in China. So, so this is context sensitive. It gives you uh, more improved accuracy in estimating the, the behaviors. Um, so I just want to um, skip this. We did some clustering to reduce the hidden uh, states. And you get really, really, really many hidden states that your training will not converge after a week. And, and you sit there, you say, OK, what am I going to do? Um, so, so some of the to test data set, we have normal traces. So in this context, so we test uh, some Linux server program uh, and Linux utility program, both synthetic traces and real world reproduced uh, attack traces. Um, so, so, so we tested the four models, and, and the reason I'm, I show this is it's just to give give some sense of how how you know one could structure the experiment evaluation. So we want to our model is called a stylo static initialized uh, hidden Markov, and so we want to show that to sti you know, we hope to to see that stylo perform better in uh, detecting anomalies uh, traces, um, and this is all sort of local. This is uh, in this experiment is. Local analysis, each uh, trace segment is about 15 call long. Uh, we compare with regular hidden Markov model with context sensitivity without context sen sensitivity. In, in, a, um, in a library called uh, x axis is a false positive, y axis is a false negative. Uh, the reason that you have serial number because the different threshold you, have, you, measure, you do a measurement. And so our numbers are um, the green really outdo the others. So why is the log access, uh, log scale? Um, so, so it's all, you know, you know, I have people ask, uh, is it fair to have, uh, um, uh, I think in this case we use anomalous, synthetic anomaly traces. Is it, is it fair? I, I, you know, when you don't have other traces, uh, this is what you want to do. And as long as the comparison is uh, side by side, it, it is reason I would say it's reasonable. Um, we also did system call. Uh, we also did, the, if you have a different hidden state, if people ask, uh, is it because of hidden states? So you have more hidden states, and that's why the, you have better results. We also uh, try the regular hidden Markov, Markov model with a different uh, number of hidden states. Uh, our um, solution still uh, perform much better. So you know it's the, the probability transitions, and this is where we make an impact, not just a hidden um, state number. 
Uh, we also reproduced the, the real world uh, attacks. And, and I think this is where, um, uh, in, in, I, I think the, the anomaly detection, one of the challenges that you sort of has to be uh, not afraid to use certain uh, data analytics tool, and also in the meantime, you have to do some system um, e evaluation. You, you sort of you have to be a different person, and, and you know, uh, collaboration is, is a. Um, is you know with a help, but on the other hand, you have to understand the both. You cannot totally rely on your collaborators uh, uh, to do this, and so so. But, but this also make it fun. I think make it harder is also make it fun. Um, tracing is extremely slow. We use S trace as I mentioned is you know um, not useful in production system. This is a, a, a illustration. This is S trace pin pin two uh, PT. This is the Intel new hardware that makes us really excited. Um, uh, uh, PT. Oh, uh, I apologize. This numbers uh, numbers uh, is a little off. Uh, yes, the the ten time is go is uh, shifted to the right. Uh, PT is uh, is uh, nine percent overhead after reconstruction. Otherwise, it's five percent. Um, so so I think this is a golden time for program anomaly detection. Even though the concept was invented 30 years ago, I think this is a time for us to revisit the topic in a more thorough way because of the, the hardware tracing, because of the data, analytic, uh, uh, data analytics de uh, technology development with uh, you know, TensorFlow, um, ability to, to, to analyze long traces. I, I think this is really a wonderful time. Uh, what we need is just, um, it, it, uh, community efforts to make it easier um, and, and make it more accessible. Um, a lot of interesting things to do um, with uh, with that. The, this is, I believe, is uh, the second to last uh, slide. Um, some open questions. So hopefully that what we have uh, show you are some examples of things that uh, you could get started. I, I think it's, it's certainly. You have to warm up to it in, in a way that you, you, no one would sort of wake up today and say, I want to do some program anomaly detection. You, ha you have to warm up to it, but then hopefully seeing how this is done, um, then, then you, you know, keep it in the back of your mind. Um, and people are doing anomaly detection. I talked to people from Netflix and you know, uh, Uber. They're doing fraud detection. But then for programs, you know, understanding programs um, in, 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 it, it's, it's slightly different and they use different tech, technologies. Um, open problems that I have, uh, we have uh, identified some. Um, not in a particular order, CPS and IoT, how to secure um, uh, those those devices, in, in, um, in, in because they, they take events, they take sensor data. Their, their programs are different, processed differently, um, require new model, tracing overhead. Um, the Markov model, a lot of the training takes a long time. Um, how can this uh, in a, in a incremental training, incremental clustering, incremental, uh, incremental one class SVN? I don't think you know, uh, this exists, but a lot of this um, it, it needs to be looked into because the program does not stay static. Um, it gets updated all the time, and the behavior changes. Um, how can you update your model? Um, and use a high performance computing facilities, so how, how can you make it faster? Uh, post detection procedures. And so far, people would publish paper, say, okay, we catch this alert, that alert, our job is done. But then, if you want to make it a, a real practical tool for um, the security analysts, they have to be told you know, how would they diagnose the alert and how even they you know, locate the alert, map the alert to the regional program. Right now, the alerts are just based on trace, traces, car traces. Uh, and there are not a lot of tools. Um, um, software in software engineering community fault uh, localization has been very well studied. Uh, uh, I, I believe a lot of techniques could be applied here. Um, um, Order aware global analysis, since Yaqui mentioned that, how to improve that. Uh, purification of training data, you know, when you do one class SVN, we assume, you know, for, for all the binary classification as well, we assume all the data comes in as a clean, but what if it's not? Um, in the, especially in the new context of the of, of, of machine learning, um, 
where you say adversary may have some ability to control certain data points um, to throw you off, to, to, make your, to break your model. Um, um, uh, how would you measure the sensitivity of your detection model with respect to um, their reliability on the training data? Uh, in the sense, if, if your model really accurate, but then it only really relies on a couple data points, if those data points are corrupted, then your model is, is uh, uh, not good. Um, all right, I, I think, um, all right, so uh, maybe we can give a, a Two questions. We can do maybe we can do two questions, and, and then we'll do the the hands-on uh, activity. Um, uh, b by the way, um, I'm gonna sh okay. I'll show you. I have just put the slides on my website, and so I'm gonna show you the URL. But before before we go into the hands-on activity, a any questions and thoughts? Uh, while building your models, do you assume do you have any assumptions of uh, so the question is a uh, hardware uh, platform, uh, any assumptions on that? Um, uh, uh, so, so, so far we've been do, doing on x86 uh, in the Linux operating environment. Um, um, if, if, if we switch to the Intel PT, then we have to assume that uh, you know, it's, it's enabled PT uh, support tracing, instruction tracing. Other than that, uh, I, I think it can be portable to Windows, uh, as long as you have ability to, to trace, and, and really uh, trace meaning the collecting behaviors of the program, as long as uh, you have that. Uh, one also related question. If I run one program with the same input twice, so 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 in terms of the deterministic of the program if you have a, the, the same input so w would you always observe the same behavior that, that's an interesting question so far we assume yes um, but I could Im imagine there are certain program maybe have you know stochastic have some random factors in it in, in that case you have to adjust but that's a good point uh, I think um, a very important perspective about program norm detection is that when you try to model normal behaviors, you try to um, use the wrap in the detection space to wrap all the normal behaviors. And you can define the wrap using those training data points with our normal ones, and you can use some parameters to adjust how far are the boundary of the wrap, normal behaviors, are from the uh, normal points you know. So those are the, the parts that you can try to involve some kind of non-deterministic things. You know that this point is normal, and you assume that, for example, some space beside it is normal, and it, it gives you some type of randomness that you try to uh, model in the detection space. Uh, okay, maybe we can yeah, take yeah, that yeah. offline, okay. yes. Um, oh, yes. One, one more question. Um, you mentioned in, each, uh, in the very beginning that one of the important breakthroughs was that you actually chopped the program into pieces to reduce this game. I was wondering how sensitive uh, are you to the places where you take the cut? I mean, that, that's probably a natural cut where you call functions, but if, if a programmer writes rather long functions, you could become sensitive actually to the places where you do the job. Uh, yes. So um, there are two parts related to the question. The first part is um, you could talk about the local analysis, which, for example, cuts the things like an n-gram. So n-gram is just a kind of sliding window. So it repeatedly cuts things one, one, um, one item by one item. So the second thing we are talking about is the global analysis. In that perspective, we need to cut things with some semantic meaning to wrap all the things within maybe one routine or in some other way. Ways. For example, for event-driven programming, we can cut the things when an event occurs. All the handling procedure is cut in one of the uh, long trace we are trying to handle. Yes. Right. Yeah. But but we didn't test uh, how sensitive. It's a good point. Yeah. 
All right. So um, if you're interested, um, and get your laptop out and do the SSH to this server, we have prepared a lab environment. So um, uh, I think we need to, let, let me type the password for you. Uh, could you uh, change it to my laptop view? Thank you. And so the, um, the tutorial shows uh, some ngram, NGRAM exercise so where you can um, try for yourself. We're also going to demo another tool. Mm, uh, just this one. Mm. Is, is it going to be on? Um, It's not showing. Mm. Something strange. No. Just announce the password. Okay. Uh, yeah, I may need it for another thing. Well, yeah, but but we okay, can okay. we can yeah, wait. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you put put this on? Put this on. So let's see if this works. So if you can start a terminal, I can just type the word in terminal, and all of oh, them will yeah. see. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, do the um, some of things here so that. Uh, okay, do you, you can put the, the password okay, here. Hold on. Okay, yes. Okay. That's so, so, get your terminal and the SSH. So this is a password. You can log in. Oh, okay. Yes. I can also. Okay, let me let me put this. Oh, never mind. <laughs> uh, can we just uh, make some? Oh there? yes. Right. How about this? Okay. Okay. So that was. Wait, th this way. Okay. All right. So you do SSH, and this is a password. to talk about what to do. Okay, sure. Uh, and a uh, useful link you can have here is the GitHub I already have. Um, so if you logged in, and uh, you can go to the GitHub here. And uh, this is uh, um, hands-on activity we will have today. Uh, click the lab task in the tutorial. Uh, uh, le let, me, let me just uh, show you. I, I put the slides online. Mm -hmm. The slides is on um, this URL. Where 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 does it go? Uh, so so at the end of this slide, 
uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but um, so at the end of this slide, it has the URLs and information. Okay, so in the hand-on activity today, we will go through the um, first to get it into the box we set up for you, and then um, I have written two simple scripts, one for building an ngram model, one for building finance data automata model for a program. And um, um, then I will, I will let you know what are, where are the uh, scripts I wrote. And then we will first do um, build a very simple ngram model out of the profile that we, we traced for some simple um, Linux utilities such as AIS. And then after we go through the, remember the, um, the uh, procedure or the overview the, about the car, how do we build the model this slide, we will go through the entire training procedure and in the task, in task B to build the ngram model. And then I will give you some um, traces and I did uh, this earlier, days ago, about uh, Firefox, and we have five benign traces there, one malicious trace, which is uh, Explorit. You can get some more information about that Explorit. Um, this is the CVE of that Explorit, and then um, I will let you to detect this Explorit using the five benign traces, using the ngram model you can build. And um, also then we will try to uh, get a sense about the false positives, that uh, when you have incomplete training data sets. Um, and then in the last task, uh, I will- Okay, I'm not sure whether we have time for oh, that. Okay, okay, then, then we, we will delay that maybe. You want to go through this step by step? Yes, sure. So- I have, I have terminal here if you want to. Okay. But you have to increase the view. view. Mm -hmm. I think I know that. Oh, this one. So, if we just. Uh, okay, probably you do this first. Uh, well, uh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep it here. He, 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 yeah, but he has some demos and stuff. We, we probably don't have time for that also. So when you get into the system, um, you get, um, let me see, what's uh What is the password again? Um, it's, let me see. Word. So here. Um, capital letter H and capital letter V, and everything else is in small letters. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, someone just removed the folder I have here. We can just uh, check it. Uh, let me see. Um, we need to check. Uh, <laughs> Please don't remove <laughs> <laughs> this is not a very secure demo, so. Um, <laughs> hopefully we have everything in the sandbox, and uh, um, so. Yeah, so, so you, can you create your own directory? Yes, uh, so everyone should create their own directory, and you can check out the GitHub here at, uh, let me see. B, okay. Oh, it's already there? Okay. Okay, then um, if you go into your own directory, for example, I create a test. And uh, the first step you will have is to trace a program and build a model, and um, which you can find the direction. Uh, let me see. Uh, on the front page that I give you. So you can use s -trace, for example, to trace some of the uh, system calls. Um, we just uh, trace the system call of LS, the local directory, and uh, we will put a system call into ls.trace, 
and that's the error store trace we get about all the system calls we have with uh, parameters and things. Um, so to simplify the thing, we do not need the parameters. We only need a sequence of system calls, and uh, we can simplify it using this script. Um, okay. So this will basically give you. Let me see. Uh, trace no such file. Mm. Oh. Somebody remove it? <laughs> this is not a good place to demonstrate your hacking techniques. Who has been doing that? Um, so maybe in that case, uh, um, we will uh, do the, uh, do you want to try the demo on your computer? Um, okay, so let me try my computer and show you that about um, the uh, NGRAM model and the finance automata that I can also show you that uh, how to visualize uh, finance automata and you can, you can do it on this box as well but uh, just do not uh, delete others file. We, we do not meant to do something like a <laughs> hacking tool here. We only want to show you some of the basic techniques that uh, people can use to, to model program behavior and try to build a model, okay. Let me see if I can get my laptop connected here. Uh, I have this laptop, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Seems that I got it. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, let me just uh, go to. Uh, If I can. So do they need to log in um, Parma to do the demo or they can? No, no, I, I can right. do it here, yeah, okay. Um, so, so as long as you follow the, the tutorial, you don't have to uh, log in to demo, uh, to this demo server. Um, and so we only have seven minutes left. Okay, that, that's fine, that's um, fine. Uh, uh, okay. So I will just uh, um, basically show them. I, I'm thinking you can demo the other advanced uh, detection on your machine, now you're connected. Yes, and yes, yeah. Skip the okay, okay, sure, sure. So Xiao Queen is gonna demo, uh, give another demo, but you can do the engram at home, follow the instruction. Um, the, the, the slides is online if you, um, um, it's, it's, it, if you Google my name, um, it's gonna be on the, the link on the first page. Okay, I think I have a version here. And uh, so um, if I just uh, click uh, directory test, and I will try to do a simple S tracing. Um, so here. This is a simple S trace uh, results, and uh, you can change it to um, a pure list of system calls, um, just uh, to substitute all the things else. And you get a sys list using the command I have, and um, um, so let's see how many lines, how many system calls we get. We get uh, 109. Uh, there is a little, let me see if you can see it here. So we have 109 uh, system calls here. And um, so I will skip the first part, which is uh, uh, ngram one, and I will just give you uh, a taste of things for the the finance automata one. So finance automata means that you build a finance automata that each state is a system call. We get whether the system call can 
be preceded by another, by succeeded by another system call using the simple finance automata model. You can further improve it using probabilities and using mm, more advanced maybe contacts of the finance automata. But here I will just show you a simple way to get a most primitive one. So if you go to, uh, so I have the finance automata um, uh, script here. You just uh, copy it. Um, I think a build DFA, yes. And it has some instructions how to run it. And you just have the sys trace as um, um, sys list. And then you want to output it to DFA. So then after running the script, build DFA, you get two files DFA dot. Um, notes, which give you all the system calls that uh, occur in that system call list we get, which are the nodes in the finance automata. You also have DFA.edges, which give you all the edge and how the two system calls can connect. That simply is a two gram out of the um, system call list we have. And then um, uh, I can use Neo4j to um, Uh, let me see, we have the import directory, yes. Oh, no. Um, DFA dot star there. And then I will use Neo4j to uh, visualize all the things we have. Okay. And it's very simple, just uh, import all the points in the Neo4j, which is a graph database you can use to visualize things. And uh, I already have the commands here for you, and it's very simple. So you import, you, you specify what are the uh, labels, uh, what are the nodes, what are the edges um, for the database to build. And uh, that's, that's all you need to specify to import things into Neo4j. Okay, and then we can start Neo4j uh, console mode, and uh, after 30 seconds or minutes, then you we will um, be ready to connect to Neo4j. This will be um, shown on my local host. Uh, let me see if I have it. Okay, so what we imported as the graph database here is. Um, is a graph called graph DB. So we also only need to match and uh, return and then we get the graph we need. And that is uh, um, find and state automata we just built. Um, if I show you with the full screen, okay. Let's get a little maybe smaller, okay. And then each of them is a system call extracted from the uh, system call list we generate um, from AIS. And uh, there are edges, that means one call can, for example, this call, uh, let me see what it is, is it open? Can succeed on um, stat system call. And uh, this is a very primitive version of finance.automata, and you can put pro uh, probabilistic into the finance.automata so that you get how likely each of the call go into an, uh, each of the uh, maybe system call can uh, succeed another. If you want to go further, you can try to monitor not the system call but the function calls or the routines of the program and get a sense how a program routine can maybe. Uh, call another routine, and so that you get a kind of a call graph information about the finance automata. If you want to um, develop even further, you can get a stack information plus this finance automata, then you build a push down automata. You can get a probabilistic version of the push down automata, and then you get a much more accurate version of what's, hap what's happening with the program. And uh, um, so that's about the, the finance automata model. So if you have time after this tutorial, you can try to um, check uh, the tutorial on GitHub to try some ngram ones. We have uh, uh, some interesting things on the ngram ones to let you understand um, how to use 
five different benign um, uh, behavior profiles to uh, assemble them into one, uh, one model and to detect the explored one. If you try to do something like to use four or three of the benign profiles to, to detect whether the, the last uh, uh, benign behavior is a type of malicious, you can do it, you will find it will be detected as malicious. That is because I traced only five different things from Firefox. For Firefox, the, the behavior detection space is so vast, you cannot only use these five tiny um, traces to represent all normal behavior so that you will get false positives. If you have set n grams n to be very large, you will get very la lot of false positives. If you set n to be small, you will get less false, positives, but you still get. So for pretty um, large programs such as Firefox, SendMail, what you need is to get a, a very comprehensive training data set, which is pretty hard, I, I, I admit. But uh, if you, um, another way is to complement it with some static analysis tools, but um, if you want to do it with dynamic analysis, um, you'd better get uh, a thousand, ten thousand of these traces to cover different uh, running cases of these dynamic behaviors you can get for the very large program with a lot of functionalities. Uh, and uh, uh, you don't need to log on to our server to do the demo. You can demo, download the files, and then demo it anywhere and try it out anywhere. Yeah. Do we have the instructions for the finite state? Uh, uh, the, uh, yes. It, it's so it, it going to be. Oh, yes, well, for okay. the final state automata, um, we have the instruction how to import that into neo 4 j and virtualize it in the script of final state automata. Okay, the good. FSA so, so then in that case, you're all set. Um, and uh, uh, so, so that that's it. Um, hope you, hopefully you find this uh, tutorial useful. This is the first time we did a tutorial, and uh, we really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, um, and and also hopefully see more work on in this direction. Thank you.